Every day I'm bombarded by news articles that make it seem like the days of short-term rentals are numbered. The Airbnb bust, the house slowdown is wreaking havoc on the short-term rental market. Vacation rental market shift leaves owners in nerve-wracking situation as popular areas remain unbooked. Listen, with so much misinformation and alarmism and skewed data going around, I wanted to talk about and dissect four myths going around right now and whether they're true or not. Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Kiavi. We're talking about short-term rentals, and if you want to get into the short-term rental game, there's one really important thing that you're going to need, financing. And that's where our friends Kiavi are going to come in. Whether you're flipping houses or buying short-term rentals, you need a reliable, fast, and simple way to get financing. But don't worry, you don't have to ask your mom for a loan because you can turn to Kiavi. With Kiavi, you can access high leverage and flexible loans like DSER loans, bridge loans, and rental portfolio loans. And guess what? Over 12,000 real estate investors have chosen Kiavi as their go-to funding partner. With Kiavi's online platform, you can get approved quickly, download your pre-qualification letters, and track your loan status 24-7. So if you want to learn more and even find out your rate, head on over to kiavi.com slash biggerpockets. That's kiavi.com slash biggerpockets. Myth number one, regulation will shut down your short-term rental business. Is this true? Is this not? Listen, if you've been following along with some of the media out there, then you've probably found out that there are a lot of bans on short-term rentals going on in different cities, like Dallas, for example. A lot of short-term rental owners out there just had their businesses shut down overnight. Even some of these short-term rental owners that previously had permits were not grandfathered in to the new ban. Same thing with New York. New York is a city that already had some pretty dicey short-term rental regulation, meaning it was already pretty difficult to run an Airbnb business there. But over the last week or two, new legislation has come in that has effectively shut down Airbnb businesses for hosts all over the city. And laws like the ones that were put in place in New York really mimic a lot of the laws that were put in place in Los Angeles. I actually experienced this myself where I was running a short-term rental business there and the new ordinances made it very difficult for me to continue running my business the way I was. So is this a myth or is it not? Well, listen, on the surface, it's not a myth. I mean, if you go into a short-term rental with that being your sole strategy, then it's very possible for you to be regulated out of your market leaving you with a house that you can't list on Airbnb, right? But the reason I think there's a little bit more to this myth is I think every good short-term rental owner should purchase a home with the intent to both use it as a short-term rental, but also a medium-term rental. A short-term rental is typically one to 30 day stays, and a medium-term rental is 30 day stays or more. Oftentimes, medium-term rentals are 30, 60, 90, or 180 days at a time. And the reason that medium-term rentals are so pivotal to so many short-term rental owners that are being banned right now is because once you cross that 30-day threshold, you no longer fall into the short-term rental jurisdiction. So a lot of these bans are for stays that are one to 30 days at a time. Once you're 30 days or more, typically a city is gonna see that as a long-term rental. And so at that point, you're just abiding by typical rental laws. Now, I'm a big believer in utilizing both of these strategies as often as possible within a single rental. My strategy is, when applicable, I try to rent my place out as a medium to rental as often as possible, and then with vacancies in between, Rent those spare days on platforms like Airbnb to fill up my calendar. We've done several episodes on the Bigger Pockets podcast with Jesse Vasquez around this very topic. And there's a little bit of legwork that goes into medium term rentals as well. It's not like you just list it on short term rental platforms and hope that you get a 30 day bookings. There are a lot of strategies that you can implement, like talking to hospitals, relocation agencies, insurance companies, and placing some of their staff or some of their displaced families into your properties for 30 days plus. We're not going to dive into how you source medium term rental contracts today, but just know we have plenty of content around this topic on the Bigger Pockets YouTube channel and podcast. All I really want you to take away from this, you should be diversifying your strategy and adding medium term rentals to the mix. That way, if a ban ever comes into play, you have your medium term rental strategy that can kick in and save your business. Myth number two, the cash flow is no longer worth it on Airbnb. Listen, there are a lot of articles out there that are talking about hosts making less money than they were in 2022, 2021, and 2020. And part of that is true. During the pandemic, there were so many people out there that were just itching to get out of their house because they were locked in their house for days, weeks, or months at a time that it created this huge travel surge and hosts saw unprecedented bookings and profits. And now we're normalizing back to normal travel and we're calibrating to the new normal where yes, revenue is not gonna be as sweet as it was in 2020. I'm sorry, host, but this is just the truth. But it doesn't mean that there's no money to be made. Listen, I think a lot of hosts were spoiled with 30, 40, 50 to 100% cash on cash returns 
And now we are seeing cash on cash returns return to planet Earth anywhere from the 10 to 20% range. But on top of that, one of the things that I often see is that Airbnb hosts are just looking at one specific metric when measuring the success of their Airbnb or short-term rental in general, and that's your cash on cash return. Effectively, this metric shows you how hard your money works for you in a year's time. And really to put it in simple terms, it's a metric that details how much cash flow you make every single year. Now, this is an important metric because a lot of short-term rental hosts get into the game because of the higher cash flows. The biggest mistake I see is really only focusing on this one specific facet of short-term rentals. That's it's just 25% of the equation because when you think about what makes up the ROI of a short-term rental, cash on cash is just one piece of that. You also have tax benefits, right? Tax deductions. You also have appreciation and you have debt pay down, meaning the mortgage that you're paying towards your house, right? In theory, other people are paying that. The actual balance on your mortgage goes down, meaning the equity goes up. And then we go back to appreciation and that is the value of your home going up as well. So not only is the value of your home going up, the debt is going down, but I think perhaps the most overlooked aspect of this are the tax deductions. Short-term rentals open up the possibility of using the short-term rental loophole, which allows you to take massive bonus depreciation through a cost segregation study. The reason this is super impactful is because typically to take bonus depreciation, you have to be a real estate professional, meaning you have to work 750 hours a year in the world of real estate, and it has to make up more than half of your time. And that's a very hard thing to do. When you materially participate in the self-management of your short-term rental, you're able to take massive bonus depreciation, which can lower and offset your tax bill by thousands, if not tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of dollars every single year. Let's get into myth number three here, and it's that short-term rentals are oversaturated. There are more people than ever getting into the game. And it makes a lot of sense when you consider that long-term rentals provide lower returns and short-term rentals typically provide higher returns. A lot of long-term investors are trying to get into the short-term rental game on top of everyone who just wants to get into real estate in general that wants to make good cash flow every single month. And so when you look around and you look at the stats of how many people are joining sites like Airbnb, Verbo, Booking.com, on the surface, it seems like there is oversaturation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that because there's more competition, you can't make more money on the platform. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is in the early days of Airbnb, you could actually just stick a mattress inside of an apartment and make thousands of dollars every single month. That's how I started. And then as the years went on, I would get onto the different platforms and see, hey, no one has nice furniture, I'm gonna do nice furniture. And then more time would pass and I would say, okay, they have nice furniture, but they don't have nice photographs, right? And so you could always outpace your competition if you just made an effort to have a nice short-term rental. Well, fast forward to 2023 and everybody's doing both. And so when you go into these different platforms like Airbnb.com and you start scrolling through your competition, you quickly see everyone's got really nice places, beautifully designed, beautifully photographed. So if you wanna combat oversaturation, you have to figure out how else you can stand out against your competition. And the way to do this in 2023 and beyond is amenities. What can you offer outside of a nice place that gives people an experience? For example, I've got a beach house in Crystal Beach. I just added this epic mini golf course. For my Scottsdale property, it was a 6,000 square foot estate on five acres and the architecture was cool, but it was missing a lot of amenities. So we invested about $22,000 into a pickleball court. That pickleball court has paid for itself three or four times over now. And then in the Smoky Mountains, I just added this epic treehouse deck with a hot tub overlooking the Smoky Mountains with an amazing view. If you can figure out how to provide your guests with an experience that's not just nice furniture and decor, that's gonna be how you combat oversaturation in the short-term rental market. Myth number four, and this is probably the most annoying one that I see if I'm gonna be completely honest with you. People are going back to hotels. Hotels are a staple in the travel and hospitality space. Now Airbnb came along and people started to realize, oh, hey, why wouldn't I just book a house? And I think the reason this myth tends to circulate around is that there are a lot of TikToks out there of people that get really mad about the cleaning fees or all of the chores that people have to do upon checkout or just the fees in general. Now, is it true that people are annoyed about the short-term rental fees? Absolutely. But I think it's important to realize that a short-term rental is a very, 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 very different thing than a hotel. A hotel does provide a very specific experience that is perfect for many situations. But then when you start thinking about families, groups of four to six, groups of eight, 10, 12, 14, 20, Hotels no longer make sense. And so I think it's easy to compare hotels and short-term rentals, but at the end of the day, they're apples to oranges. Airbnbs offer one house, 
one experience, a kitchen, multiple bathrooms. If you wanna get into the game, don't charge an $800 cleaning fee and then ask your guests to mop the floors, uh, squeegee your windows, re-roof your house, rake the front yard. Give them very simple checkout instructions. That's ultimately what the heart of this negative sentiment is coming down to. But at the end of the day, hotels will never be able to provide what a full-scale Airbnb provides. And as long as there are groups of four to 20 people traveling, then short-term rentals are here to stay. So to sum up myth number four here, don't fall for all the negative TikToks that say that the days of Airbnb are over because really, I think we're just getting started. And that's today's video. We talked about four big myths ranging from regulation will shut down your Airbnb business to the cash flow is no longer worth it to Airbnb has become oversaturated to people are going back to hotels. Hopefully my point of view has given you some insight that it's not all doom and gloom out there and that there's still an opportunity to build wealth through short-term rentals.